At this year's Star Wars celebration, we met special effects makeup artist Nick Maley, who was part of Stuart Freeborn's team on The Empire Strikes Back that created the original Yoda puppets. Nick, who's known as That Yoda Guy, brought with him a Yoda puppet of his own making, the culmination of a multi-year journey to create a perfect replica of the original using the same techniques he and his colleagues employed over 40 years ago. Hey everyone, it's Norm here from Test It at Star Wars Celebration, and it's my great pleasure to meet and introduce you to Nick Maley. Nick, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, well, thanks, Norm. I'm really happy to be uh, here with Test It at this great event. Yeah, and not only are you here, you've brought one of your creations here, yes. a long journey that you have uh, revisiting yes. the original puppet for Yoda, which uh, you were one of the people who worked on it in Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, Stu Freebaum was the mastermind behind all the creatures. And we thought Stu was gonna be, the, you know, Yoda was gonna be his pet project. Um, and I, I was, at that point in time, I was the guy who was making the molds and the skins and the, the hands and the feet. Um, there, were, there were several key contributors, so I wasn't the only Yoda guy that was there. Yes. Um, but um, I ended up being, uh, becoming more uh, important to that particular project uh, because they wanted a walking Yoda separately and Stu was busy, so I devised that. Then they wanted a radio controlled version and I worked with the radio control techs to do that. So when the main puppet had some hiccups, they asked me if I could build a backup. And that backup was made in a much simpler fashion than what Stu was doing. And I could never have done it if I hadn't been standing there watching what Stu was doing. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, since working on dozens and dozens of films, you, you're going back to Empire Strikes Back to that puppet in this journey. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I, one of the things, I've got a, a book that I wrote. Um, which is a motivational book really about how you, what you have to do to follow your dreams to get from nowhere to somewhere. Um, and one of the things that was really specific to that is that struggle that you go through, first of all, to get into the industry and then through the, all those times of being unemployed. Um, Yoda, that turn, what that, you know, the first big turning point was getting on the team to build creatures for the Mos Eisley Cantina. Yeah. And then the second big turning point was working on Yoda because then suddenly people knew what I could do and how I could do it, you know? A great Stu, calling card. Stu's number two was his son, Graham, who's an unsung hero of Star Wars. Most people have no idea who he was or what he did, but he, he, he kind of made 80% of the stuff that was there. Uh, so he was Stu's right-hand man and I was his left-hand man. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, tell me then about the journey to recreate that Yoda and what it's taken to do this piece. The, the journey really started when, um, when they started to do all the digital versions of Yoda. And I felt that it was a shame to see that original technology, not the modern version of what people call animatronics, but that, you know, that groundbreaking moment, that tech, it's a shame to see that, you know, basically drifting away, like passing away, like people, die or it's like the technology dies. And I wanted to try and, and do a rebuild to show people. I also, through my nonprofit, I like to, to go to kids' hospitals and, and to schools to you know, talk about making the most of your life. And it, it seemed to me that making a puppet would be a great way yeah. of catching kids' attention to, to give them that message. Yeah. And so I built a Yoda completely from memory. Not this one, but one where I just built, I built the mechanism the same way, but the outside, it was, a, you know, I had to sculpt it and do whatever and look at photos and say, yes, oh yes. yeah, I remember. So I, uh, Lucasfilm invited me to show that at uh, Star Wars Celebration Europe. Uh, I, when I showed that, I made a more solid connection with the guys from Prop Store, uh, and they connected me with the people who had relics that came out of Stu's attic. And so even though I had finished a, a Yoda, suddenly I had the ability to make one that was exactly like the original. Yes. And so I couldn't resist spending another five years, you know, putting the rest of it together. So 
the, the critical thing when you're trying to make something that already exists is much harder than just making something that's new. You make something that's new, you sculpt something up, you go, oh, that looks good, that'll do, right? When it's, when it's Yoda it's, or any other character that people have already seen, you're being terribly meticulous. So I think that, you know, I think the little bit here was a bit to the right yeah. or whatever else. Uh, so we managed to get a number of different relics that I reverse engineered to take back into a clay form. Mm -hmm. And then with the molds. clay, mm -hmm. I managed to put those all back into, into one piece. Yeah. And then from that one piece, make all the molds again wow. that would allow me to make the foam skins and make the skulls and make the other things the same way. Um, I got the lady who painted the eyes um, originally uh, uh, Leslie from Nissel um, painted the, the Yoda eyes in 1979. Uh, we got her to paint these eyes for us too. Um, we got uh, some uh, a match of the co of the costume mm -hmm. from uh, from the Lucasfilm archive, uh, and so um, you know the stick itself that came out of the mold from Return of the Jedi. Uh, the, the the head was was wrecked, so I had to sculpt the head, but the rest of it comes from that, to try and make something that, uh, that is absolutely screen accurate. Right. Now, one of the things that is always gonna be different between what you saw on screen and a static figure like this is the lower part of the face is pushed out by the hand of the puppeteer that goes inside. And as long as the puppeteer's arm isn't in there, it's going to recede slightly, but I, 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 think, um, I think it works pretty well. This is made as a complete puppet, so it can be worn mm. and operated just like the original, um, but it also can be mounted on this display. Wow. And these uh, hand controls are different to how we set the original hand controls, but they do exactly the same thing. Now, a, a really important person, another key member like myself to the team was Wendy Midner, who came from the Muppets. And uh, Wendy was the one who built the body. Uh, and she's actually sculpted the hands and the feet. And she came up with this wonderful ear mechanism that is really so expressive. I don't think it's ever been matched, really. Can you because, that? yeah, the, the, um, Controls you have here, two of them control the upper part of the ear and two of them control the lower part of the ear. Mm. And so you can say, oh, I've got, uh, let me work it on this side. You, you can say, oh, I've got movement of the ears going up and down, but you can also control that from the bottom by pushing it up or pulling it down. Wow. So by controlling the two, you can push the ears out or pull them in or take them up or wow. take them down in a very um, expressive fashion. People today talk about uh, animatronics and they instantly think of radio control. Yoda had no ra radio control at all. We were, we were makeup artists, not engineers. And we approached it from the principle of what was organic what would give us a soft, believable movement, which I think you know, we achieved with the ears and also with the eyes. They have a softness to the movement that you never really get when you're, when you're dealing with, uh, with, with direct rods coming off of servos. It's yeah. always a, a kind of click, click right, motion. Right, right, right. Uh, whereas these, uh, I always design a degree of compression into the mechanism so it it moves in a much softer fashion, almost, because your shoulder is, is a ball and socket held together by rubber bands. <laughs> it's not a ball race and yeah, a, yeah, a hinge, yeah. right? The equivalent of ligaments. Yes, but, exactly. Yeah, in puppet form. To get him to do everything, we need three puppeteers. The eyelids as well. The eyelids on my version, I did separately. You'll see, it, they move in a very soft and gentle fashion. And that, that's the key to anything that is biological. It's trying to get it to get that soft and believable movement. Um, really, I would have thought that uh, the term soft mechanics was better than animatronics, 
because everybody rushes out to the radio control store. Um, but um, you get a much more believable thing. On, on movies that I did afterwards, um, one of the movies where I did a lot of tra transformations and, and animatronics using, um, using servos, uh, was a movie called uh, Life Force, where we had uh, major in-camera transformations. And despite how clever that was and what a fantastic team I had working for me on that particular movie, um, none of it is as soft and believable as a, as a personality as Yoda was brought to life by those great puppeteers that operated the puppet that we built. Yeah. In terms of uh, materials, um, are you, in, in these replicas and these recreations, you know, it's all, this the, foam, same all the same foam latex? Exactly the same. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I was the guy who made the foam latex skins for the original. So I just did the same thing, right? Yeah. And so these, these materials are super soft. You have to be very careful with foam latex because the oil in your hands um, and, and oil in the, in, the, in the atmosphere can uh, attack that, and daylight too. But just to demonstrate, you'll see that it, the, the material is super soft. Um, and, uh, and that's why it can move in such a, a, a believable fashion. You get a lot of subtle movements out of it. Yeah, and uh, do you keep an eye to preservation and durability? All right, well, preservation is another issue. You know, I, this will be going to the collectors who helped me by letting me have access to those the relics that came out of the molds in the first place. Yes. Um, and I've said to them, you really need to keep it in a box. Don't put it in a glass case. You put it in a glass case, even just light like this is going to destroy it over 10 years or so. You, you know, you, you almost want to keep it in a, a single wardrobe where when you open the door, the light comes on, right? And you look at it and you enjoy it and you close the door again, right? And, and that, that way it should last. Uh, I've seen foam latex kept in a box for 20 odd years without it deteriorating. What do people not know, realize about Yoda, you know, until they've seen it animated in person or seen the puppet? If, if I've only seen Yoda from the movies or the different representations. Well, actually, I, I get a lot of people who get off the cruise ships. Uh, I'm in St. Martin in the Caribbean. Uh, they, and so our, our, our clientele are largely cruise ship people. They often say, oh, was he really that small? Well, he couldn't be any taller than the length of Frank Soz's arm, right? So, you know, those are the physical things that limited it. Yoda's head sticks forward from his body. Why? Because a hand sticks forward from an arm, right? Mm. So you have to take the limitations and then design the art around it to look believable. And I guess we did, otherwise people wouldn't still be saying that. Yeah, and even as you were setting this up, you're saying Yoda needs to be looked at from a certain angle, a certain height. Yeah, because that's well, how most it was of the time he's filmed, you're looking slightly down on him. If, yeah. you, if you crouch on the floor and look up, you're looking up his nose. The same thing is true with the lighting. There are photographs of the original puppet without the arm inside, dropped on a chair in ordinary lighting. You would never believe it was the same puppet. Yoda was actually always lit from above and slightly behind so that they cast this, this um, pattern of light where the lower part of his face was in shadow. If you floodlight it from the front, you go, yeah, it's kind of, well, it's got, it's green and pointy ears, right? You know, it's sort of similar, but if the lighting isn't the same, then you, you, you don't get it. I'm, I'm still taken aback by the, the ear animation right. and the movement, the multiple degrees of movement and yes. the piece of the softness. Yeah, and especially once the puppeteer's got his arm inside and you've got the head movement, you've got the jaw movement, you've got the movement of the lips. Mm. You, you, you can put all the lip controls for it being able to talk and do other things, but you don't get the subtlety that you, of expression that you get out of a puppeteer just doing something like that, right. that just gives you a... <laughs> you can't do that with a servo, right? Yeah. It you, just gives it a, a, you know, a more unique uh, element. And over the past five years of working on this and the weeks and weeks to make even this one, you've been documenting 
the process. Yeah, we documented quite a lot of it online, and I, I we have our own uh, YouTube channel, which is uh, uh, Nick Maley, that Yoda guy. And I do videos where I talk from the inside about certain things, like the bloopers in the Moss Eisley Cantina, and about um, you, you, about how about sculpting Yoda and about doing different elements of it that um, that are really stuff you can information you can only get from someone who was actually there. Mm. And you're launching a documentary soon or crowdfunding? Yeah, it. we're working on a documentary to try and tell the try to to tell the story about the building of Yoda, but uh, on a on a very personal level. It's about my pilgrimage to go back and find those guys that we all worked with together and to get them to tell their story rather than me say, oh, this was Wendy and she made the hands. Wendy's got a much better insight of what she did than I have. And I want to capture all of these people because you know, every year we lose how many Star Wars people, right? People that, that have built uh, different things. A lot of the information in the archive, most of it comes from interviews of people who were not there, right? People who run the archive were not there. And so if they don't ask the right questions, they often give a, a, you know, a, a misleading thing. The puppeteers for Yoda, they interviewed, uh, at the time, they interviewed uh, Frank, um, and no one interviewed the other puppeteers. So for 20 plus years, Frank was the only person that anyone talked about as being a Yoda puppeteer. It wasn't until I put up a, one of my websites, is, it's an old website, so it's not in great condition, I'm afraid, um, but it's uh, those Yoda guys, where I at least listed everybody. That, uh, that was involved. So people didn't think I was trying to claim I did everything. That's the documentary, brilliant. we're hoping to uh, run a Kickstarter. It, it, there's been a lot of enthusiasm for it because as, as people who made these things pass, there is so much of their experiences that are lost. The stories that they would tell while we were sitting down having a cup of tea or, or whatever else, those are not the things that were properly recorded. And so I want to be able to record in depth, you know, their memories of how things were and how things changed. Not from the glamorous point of view, but from the trenches, really. Really appreciate your time. You're on welcome. That and your stories. Nick, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time oh, no, to come you. down and, and see what we got. Since we met Nick at Celebration, he's been raising funds to film his documentary to tell the stories of his fellow effects artists. You can support Nick's work and learn more in the links below, including a raffle to win a miniature Yoda statue sculpted by Nick himself. Thanks for watching.